Okay, that's changed. Zoom is a new record. Anyway, who cares about recording politics when we've got a whole Mission Impossible to discuss? Agent Loki. Morning, Mr. Hunt. Sorry I barged in on your vacation. Well, Mr. Hunt, I don't quite know where to begin. You know me? No. Should I? She's got no training for this kind of thing. But to go to bed with a man alive, him, she's a woman. She's got all the training she needs. Mission Impossible 2, Katrina. I know, I'm so excited to talk about it. Katrina, uh, as Uffa mentioned, I gave you the choice of doing three movies and you said, no, I want to do six movies and we're doing them, we're doing Mission Impossible. Um, as we spent a little bit of time discussing last week, or last episode rather, I, I think, I uh, can't remember how I've scheduled these, but a um, bit of the black sheep, well, no, 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 a black sheep would insinuate that there's like something secretly good about it. <laughs> Welcome to Australia, mate. This ain't funny. The mother of all nightmares is on the loose. I don't think I can do it. I mean, it'll be difficult. Very. Well, this is not mission difficult, Mr. Hunt. It's mission impossible. Should be a walk in the park for you. You gotta be kidding. This message will destruct in five seconds. This is, yeah, this film is, um, there's something secretly fun about it. I don't hate it as much as I thought I did. Neither do I. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I like it or think it's a good film. Oh, no. I think it's definitely bad in many, many ways, but has a lot of enjoyable qualities. Yeah. And let's, also... talk about the, let's talk about these uh, enjoyable qualities. And I, I certainly think it's a John Woo movie. I, John Woo is, you know over-the-top action to the extreme, and, and sh we should get that. Um, multiple. We get, lot, we get lots of somersault kicks from lots of e Cruz. Lots of somersault kicks, and also multiple times where two vehicles collide and spin, um, or at least the people on them spin. Well, anyway, it will be discussed. What's your relationship to Mission Impossible 2, Katrina, regarding in the, in the Mission Impossible pantheon? Um, well, Tom, who's currently drinking out of a two-litre bottle of Pepsi. I'll let you know it's a 1.5-litre bottle. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I went to KFC and I said, and can I have a large Pepsi Max, please? Expecting them to just get me a large, you know, cup. And I couldn't give me a full bottle. <laughs> hey, okay. I mean, brilliant, I brilliant. Anyway, my relationship. Mm, nice. Mm. My relationship to I've obviously Mission Impossible as a whole. My relationship with it is that I was introduced to it by my dad, who's a an avid fan of mm -hmm. the first film. So much so that if I was a boy, I was going to be named after the Titch, you know, you know, Ethan Ethan. Kittredge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to be named um, Kittredge actually, um, if I was you know, a boy, but I wasn't, I was a girl, so I was stuck with this name, which is <laughs> a good name, a nice actually. Name. Yeah, it's a good name, it's a good name. Um, and if you're a girl, you're going to be called Bellerophon. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Which, no, I couldn't have been because this film came out after I was born. Uh, however, yeah. other, other children in the in your, in your your unit clan are called Chimera and Valerian. <laughs> Chimera. No, my little brother's called Ethan. Oh, well that, make, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but this film, I, d- I remember this film so, like, but only certain parts of it. For example, him throwing the sunglasses off yeah. and them exploding. Him on the side of the, you know, the rocks, the song. Da, 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 da. That is stuck in my head. And I've always, like, when I think of Mission Impossible, I do think of that. Mm-hmm. And a scene from Mission Impossible 3, which scarred me as a child. Um the shooting of Michelle Monaghan? No, 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 no. We'll we'll talk about that more on the on you know the third okay. one. But um, yeah. Or is so, it Philip Seymour Hoffman coming up from washing his face and Philip Seymour Hoffman's behind him? No, it's when his protege that he saves um, her eyes when the thing the thing explodes in her head. Her eyes go all funny, and I don't know why, but it scarred me as a child. But Mission Impossible Two. That's I remember this one a lot. Like. Um, him jumping out of the building, yeah. um, her like, you know, she's like literally typhoid Mary, or whatever, or Chimera <laughs> Naya, or whatever. Um, so like th- those kind of things, like the ridiculousness, the you know, the Spanish dancing and the the car chase. Those are the things that I remember, and the the two motorcycles colliding. You know that that <laughs> that's what when I think of Mission Impossible, that's what I think of. Mm. You could make the argument that this could should have been the best film. John Woo is an excellent director. Robert Town is one of the greatest screenwriters we have. He, I mean, he did patch up work on Mission Impossible 1 as well. Tandy Newton is excellent. Tandy Anthony Newton. Hopkins for two scenes? Two and- scenes? <laughs> And, I, and you know what? I think the big winner of this podcast is going to be Do Grey Scott, who I think is a great, great villain. Really? Oh, is this a point of contention? I think Do Grey Scott was pretty fun and pretty nice and evil in this. Yeah, um, I agree. Mm. But I didn't, I didn't like him as an actor. I don't think. <laughs> Are you? So you're quite happy that he had lost out on Wolverine. Yeah, um, I just think that he wasn't that convincing, like the bit. Oh, well, yeah. Can we pause yeah, yeah. a second? My sister keeps ringing me. That's and absolutely then... fine. And pause. We're back. Do Grey Scott podcast continues. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Do Grey Scott. Yeah. Are you, are, I... you, are you talking specifically about when he takes off his Ethan mask and he's crying? Because that is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was just going to say. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, exactly what I... Because I think he's had the tear pen. He's had the tear pen on, but he's also not acting like he's crying. And I think in his head he was like, I'm I'm a big, I'm a big evil villain and I'm so angry and I'm going to stand completely still, but there's going to be tears. But it just looks like... What's that accent? That's not his accent. Oh, I'm do grace. Also, I think he sounds too much like Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can think. Well, to imagine if they'd hired Michael Mike Myers because they were like, listen, we need someone Scottish, <laughs> but we can't get do grace Scott in. Whatever his name is. And he goes, can I you know do the it? Best Scottish Scottish performer. And you're like, oh, but, uh, Billy Connolly. No, fat bastard. <laughs> exactly. Oh. He just sounds too much like Shrek to me. I just, I don't know. I wasn't convinced by him a lot of the time, no. you know, that, but that was just me. You know, I felt but like. Isn't this is... whole movie pinches of salt and stretching of belief? Yeah, I just, I just feel like, I don't know. Maybe Hugh Jackman would have been really good. <laughs> they should have swapped. This is my thing. Like, why didn't they have like an Australian villain? They're in Australia. Why is the villain not Australian? Well, they've got South African Richard Roxborough, who's actually, who's actually Australian. Australian. <laughs> I, 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 think I saw. I, I was because I was watching a video about Mission Impossible Two earlier, and mm. they said like I think the only reason that they had him do a South African accent is because Tom Cruise wanted to do a South African accent at the end. 
that I mean that that makes complete sense to me. I love nothing more than like overproduced DVDs, special features for bad movies. I watched Basic Instinct 2 the other day and I watched the interviews after. There's a number two? Oh yeah, it's terrible. But and like there's a there's like one of the behind the scenes things is it's an interview with Sharon Stone and she and it and the thing is they're talking about the first film. And she goes, the first basic instinct was so sexy and intelligent and funny and interesting. And then it just like cuts away from her. <laughs> and, uh, and she says nothing about the second movie. And I, and I was sat alone as I, as I normally am. And I laughed out loud. Uh, it was very good. Um, he's uh, Richard Roxburgh, obviously very, 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 very accomplished Australian theatre actor. He's like... Um, one of Kate Blanchett's best friends, like Kate Blanchett's married to a guy named Andrew Upton, and he's like the top theatre director in Australia. And so, like every year, Richard Roxburgh and Kate Blanchett will be in like the best reviewed play <laughs> of like the year in Australia. Yeah, I just think it's weird that they they gave. I think he would have been a better main. Ooh. Well, we know how good a well. Do we know how good a villain he can be? Because he's Dracula in 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 Van Helsing, and he is pretty insane there. Uh, but he's also more famously the Duke in Moulin Rouge. <laughs> Ooh, I've never seen Moulin Rouge. You've never seen Moulin Rouge. There's a lot of films that you've told me to watch that I haven't watched, Tom. This is true. I mean, but well, I don't think Moulin Rouge has ever like topped my lists. Of like movies you should watch. I'll watch it eventually. None of the rules you'd like. You love Hugh McGregor. Yeah, I know. I think you told me to watch it one time, and I just went right. Well, not going to do that, am I? Same I know, with well, Casablanca. Same with Harry Met yeah. Sally. Podcast listeners, if Tom tells me to watch a film, I'm not going to watch it. I don't know why. I don't. It's the, one of the only things I'm really stubborn on. Is is that? And also, in the case of like Moulin Rouge and When Harry Met Sally, these are movies that you will really, really enjoy. Yep. <laughs> yeah yeah no I'm, I'm fully aware of it fully aware of it yeah but anyway back to mission impossible 2 back to mission impossible 2 back to richard roxborough and do grace scott the podcast um youtube comments mission impossible 1 is a spy film and ethan is low-key while mission impossible 2 is an action film and ethan is level 1000 badass kind of true Kind of true. I mean, oh, this yeah. is this is such a this is the furthest away from number one. Yeah, I think, and it's and it's back to back. <laughs> and it's like, did Mission Impossible two save the franchise, or did it almost ruin it? Well, how 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 long is it before uh, Mission Impossible three? I want to say 2004, so I want to say about four years, but it might be 2006. So it it's might 2006, be that's six years, and then and then it's 2011, so that's still a pretty big gap, but then, like, we've been, like, every two years since. Yeah, um, like, you know, is it Macquarie? He came in, Yeah, yeah, he's the man. and Tom Cruise was like, oh, now, now we're, well, now we're getting started. Hmm. I think... I think three saved the franchise, but without number two, you wouldn't have anything else because I think number two kind of put it on the map because it was the most like watched film of 2000, like in the cinemas. I was going to say, was... I've got some numbers for you here. Budget 125 million, box office 546 million. Yeah. And it's pretty it was good numbers insane. for a film that's pretty bad. You know, obviously we're watching this having seen the rest of the series. Mm. We've seen Fallout. We've seen Mission Impossible Fallout. We know how good it can get. Yeah. But say you're, you are like our age, but we're in the 2000s and we're big fans of action. This film is like perfect. It's like that mind-numbing action type of film that was really popular. But I also That's think coming off of Bright, uh, coming off of Mission Impossible, you'd be okay, they've jumped the shark here, I'm enjoying this, but this is different. I still think you'd have those thoughts. No, I suppose so, but like, but more more what I'm saying is not fans of the first one necessarily, but, because I don't even think you have to see, have seen the first one to watch this one. Oh, no, no, not at all. You just have to have a, you don't even have to have a vague knowledge of Mission Imp the Mission Impossible lore, do you? 
no because it, it to me it is just that kind of mind-numbing action film that was really popular in the late 90s early 2000s it feels like this should be the first film yeah this feels like the 90s sexed up actioned up big film remake of a classic 60s tv series and then the second one or they try again or something and then they're like no we're going back to the roots of the show and you and you get mission impossible mm. uh limp biscuit rocks and john oh woo's God. action scenes are awesome limp biscuit yeah um the music in this film I like that. I like how the Limp Biscuit starts. I kind of like the good. Yeah. That's cool. And then suddenly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is what is that theme song? What is that opening title card? That is, I remember mean, Phil watched it and we just like we're like, what the heck? And is then this? when he's when he's climbing his rocks, it's Ico Ico, but with some like nineties hip hop over it. Yeah, yeah. Also, <laughs> did people forget that Ico Ico starts Rain Man? We've already watched a movie. <laughs> With a big no, Tom I feel like movie. that was intentional, to be honest. Well, it's like, fuck Rain Man. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm, getting away cars. From, I'm getting away from Rain Man now. Watch me jump off some rocks. <laughs> <laughs> My grandma, city, your grandma, sitting by yeah, the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting on the three hour epic that John Woo wasn't able to release. Come oh, on, yeah. Paramount Studio and Tom Cruise. I want it on Blu ray like today. If the Blu ray extended three and a half hour cut that John Woo wanted to make came out tomorrow, I would buy it out of morbid curiosity. And because I, I feel like we'd have to watch it together, I feel like we'd have to but sort that out. Would somehow. a longer version of this be better? Uh, apparently there's a lot of in the original version like you know his director's cut or whatever mm. there were a few storylines that like were more fleshed out but also i think i saw enough of it i yeah. think i saw enough of mission impossible too when fucking i know that justice league was like wholly different and everyone was like wow but also my first thought was i do not need to watch four hours of a movie I do not I, I do not too. actually need more than this. Yeah. I do not need more of Gal Gadot Gal Gadot's wooden acting. Thank you very much. I've told you the story about the the, uh, the watching Justice League. I watched Justice League like five days after uh getting broken up with after three years. And I was like, I'll just go to I'll just go to the cinema because it's something to do. And these two fucking kids next to me, they were like like 12 or something, they were like puberty. And they're like anytime Gal Gadot would come on, they're like, oh, it's off it, it's off it. And like Batman said something like, I need to give her this. And then they were like, oh, yeah, I like, I like, I like give, him, give him my dick. And, I, and then I, I, I feel, Where are they from? Where are these people from? They're just, like, they're just, they're just like accent kids. you're putting on. No, it's just English. It was just like, they were just eh, Wakefield kids. Eh, Essie, she's so hot. <laughs> That's what it sounded like. Cabro. But they, no, it, it was just. And it got to a point, and I very loudly said, could you please be quiet? <laughs> and uh, maybe it was the breakup. Maybe it was by... In- in- incessant? Is that a word? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just kept going, incest, incest. incest. <laughs> maybe it was my incest fury, <laughs> uh, which is the name of my punk band. Um, this film actually holds up. Mm, in many ways I know it doesn't <laughs> easily it doesn't, the worst in the series it's missing the smart ingredients yep um, and you know what Luther was totally underutilised in this film I said it if he didn't have his moustache then I would say get Luther away from this stinky turd I love Luther I love Luther too um, this is my favourite character. Ving Rhames' head is getting bigger. If you look from the first one to this one, his head is increasing in size. Also, I think this is the only one where he's got a moustache. I could be wrong. He could have one in three. He's got a pretty cool moustache in this, yeah. I do believe he's the only... He, this is the only one where he's wearing a moustache. And I, I do like that... I don't know. 
you know in the when we watched the first one and i went you know what actually this film's kind of woke yeah I take it back about Mission Impossible 2. Why are they all so nasty about Thandie Newton? <laughs> They're so nasty about Thandie Newton. Luther's just like really vain now. He's just like, they got hold him out Versace and, 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 and just my Gucci shoes. All he yeah. cares, he's turned into Patrick Bateman. He just cares about brands. Um, every, yeah, just that There's horse that... blood. <laughs> the, and I, even Anthony Hawkins, like, the bit where he says, oh, she doesn't need training to be a spy. She's a woman. Yeah, what I've, got hear, I've got to hear the best line. To go to bed and lie. She's a woman. She's got all the qualifications she'll need. <laughs> what? Part late, there was a part later because she's called Miss Hall. And I had my subtitles on, but I wasn't looking at the screen at the moment. And it was like the debrief. And Anthony Hopkins says, Miss Hall's blood. But the way he said it with his accent, it sounded like this Hall's blood. But, but I was like, not shocked. I was just like, yeah, okay, they're right. So yeah. this, this horse blood has been no longer contaminated. In, in, comparison, <laughs> in comparison to the first film where the only person who says anything like massively sexist is the villain, mm-hmm. now you've got one of the <laughs> supposed good guys spouting sexist rhetoric about how women lie in bed. Mm. It's not untrue, but it's not true either. Mm. I don't think Naya's the type of woman to lie in bed. Oh. Um, no. Oh, wait, wh- which lie? You know, she's not faking it. That's what I'm saying. Oh, right. Very but I don't I... think with Ethan you'd need to. No. I feel like well, Ethan would be a very we... sensual lover. We know that uh, she likes to go on top when we have that lovely wacky banter. <laughs> Is the chemistry good or... Um... No, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> she's not good. I'd, we've had this conversation multiple times. I don't think Tom Cruise has ever had incredible chemistry. We talked about this with Kristen Scott Thomas. He's got better chemistry with Kristen Scott Thomas when they're fake kissing than he does with Rain Man, than he does with his own wife on screen in Days of Thunder. <laughs> and, um, I, know, I, think, I think he has good chemistry with Ilsa in the later... Yes, yes, no, yeah. But that's and but that's like Clarice and Hannibal. It's like appreciative. It's not sex. This is what I'm saying though. This is this this is why this film is so weird to me because you know how in the last one we did about Mission Impossible One, mm. I was saying how Ethan is is quite sexless mm. in every film except this one. This is the only other than like maybe with his wife. Yeah, but he's in... with his wife. Of course, he's sexless. Oh, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could see my face right now. Yes, um, for our video listeners, Katrina, uh, Katrina is not with us. Oh, <laughs> but like in this, this is like the only one where like it feels like oh, sex, sexy. Mm. And he doesn't pull flamenco it dancers. Oh, it's sexier than a flamenco. Da- Somebody watched Mask of Zorro and was like, "Wow, these guys are sexy." And then they were just like, uh, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> And they thought yeah. it's the flamenco, not the fact that it's Antonio Banderas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Oh, and and Anthony, Anthony Hopkins. No way, yeah. But it's, it, it just, it, 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 it does feel weird. Like, this is the one where Ethan feels the least like Ethan in yeah, the entire cause series. Because he's a goddamn gymnast and he's, he's a stud. And He's got a lot of beautiful, long, flowing locks. Yes, he does. He has a marvelous. Sense um, of he like he just feels like really different to the rest of the series, which whatever they want to take it in a different direction. But I'm John Woo was the only director they didn't ask to come back for a third for another film, which I thought was quite funny. It's pretty funny. Uh, takes us into the Katrina Unit One Star Review Connor. I blame John Woo for this one. <laughs> Uh, well, that was a pretty pure excuse for a movie. I liked the first and third, but the second was awful. You you would know John Woo was involved by the inclusion of doves flying through the underground. What there. is with him and pigeons? <laughs> Have you seen Face Off? I haven't, but I Face know there's off pigeons is like in it. Doves to the extreme. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. It's doves. John Woo, it's specifically doves. Like it starts in hard boiled and then it goes to the extreme in face off. And then in this, it's pigeons. And you're like, okay, he can't have doves. He's got pigeons. And then like two minutes later, there's a fucking dove. 
it's just weird. Does he have a bird fetish? Oh. My favourite bit, my favourite use of birds in this one is when, um, like, the... How do I explain it? When he's it, it just blown up the pipe bomb and he yeah. walks past the open door. He just walks past the open door that has been blown up. Absolute fire do- in Doom Grey Scott's eyes. <laughs> and the dove just flies in. And it's like, why did he blow it up just to walk past? Make that one make yeah. sense. Uh, one star review Diabolical MTV farce. Um, finally, let's progress to the ending and look at the absolutely diabolical final fight scene. It's never a good idea to analyse the ending of a film. <laughs> On this occasion, <laughs> the terrible motorbike and hand-to-hand combat events at the end needs to be talked about. The bike scene is awful, but simply, it is pointless. Set to your typical MTV soundtrack and with Mortal Kombat-style fighting, the whole scene is a joke with absolute no merit. Incredible take there to never analyse a movie's ending. <laughs> Someone here says, horrible sequel. So many slow shots of nothing. Very wooden acting from everybody. Dialogue is all from a book of cliches. So much set up. The first hour, nothing happens. Just all around huge disappointment. And you know what? I don't disagree with anything that they've just said. But it is ruined by slow-mo and cheesy shots. Here's another one. Why is there so much slow-mo in this film? My favourite for definite, other than when they first meet, other than the car chase, um, <laughs> is is got to be the bit where he catches her scarf. Oh yeah! Bang. Wow. <laughs> um, and our Brilliant. final one star review: Come home, Brian De Palma. All is forgiven. Why is everyone afraid to tell the truth about this film? It sucks. This may be a bigger embarrassment to Australia than the Republic referendum. <laughs> I do think it's weird that they chose to set it in Australia. Why? I don't think it's weird. Australia's a good setting. Yeah, but like, I don't know. It just feels weird. Mm. Like, an interesting place. I suppose it's just most things aren't set in Australia. You know, like, mm. they tend to go somewhere a bit more exotic and they went, yeah, Sydney. My favourite moment was when Bing Rames stepped out of the helicopter and into the script. He's just a wonderful... He's just truly is the best part of all the Mission Impossible films. He's a delightful, delightful, delightful individual. It takes us into a 10 minute stretch. Oh, I've not on. seen him in anything but Mission Impossible. Have you not seen Pulp Fiction? Oh, wait, yeah. Hmm. Never mind. I have seen him in stuff other than... Uh... I'm going to go medieval on your ass. Stuff. Okay, yeah. I have I have seen him in other things then. Um, which takes us into um our ten minute stretches. I don't really have any excellent, excellent ten minute stretches. Here's the thing. I think instead we need to do what made you go, oh my god, what is this? That's that's the ten minute stretch. I well no, I've put here my first ten minute stretch is labs, the first lab sequence, and then my second ten minute stretch, more labs. Um, however, yeah, when it came to, well, right, we're going to combine single minute and whatever the minute, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because there, are, I think the atrium sequence and falling in is pretty good. And I know it's just, good. I know yeah. it's just Langley again. <laughs> but it was but very like, well handled. Times, yeah. Times two. I, mm. the, oh, the literal first minute of this film had me laughing and and going yes please maintain this energy for two hours and it's the guy from mm. snatch <laughs> but it's the blade yeah and, and he's just talking um oh, what am i doing what's his name i want to give him a real name i don't want to be rude um rade oh it's tough than expected rade serbedzia Rabed Serbadzia, who was just just in Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise, playing a really creepy guy who pimps his underage daughter out. Incredible choice for Tom to bring him back. Mm. Um, and he's and he's also in um, Snatch. 
I do quite like the I do quite like the cold opening. You know the bit where Tom Cruise goes, "You keep calling me Dimitri. You really shouldn't do that." No, I'm that's like, cool. I I think it yeah, works. that's cool. I like that cold opening. I think it's great. Um, I love that they just crash a plane. plane. I was yeah. going to say never brought up again. A hundred hundreds of people dead. Never brought children, never, never, men, <laughs> women, children, <laughs> and it's just never brought up as like a thing of they killed a plane, Ethan. They killed a plane of people. No, no, it it is brought up again. It is brought up again because that's why Naya agrees. Oh, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. Oh, sorry. World's biggest. She's like, if I do fun. She'd be like, who would do a thing like this? Sean Ambrose for a start. Um, Mm. But I liked just him describing Chimera. And nobody can say Chimera normally. They have to go, "Mm, Chimera. And Bellerathon. Bellerathon. Um, for ten minutes, I do. I hate it, but this is what it's like. Iconic. I have to say the car chase scene with them two, where they crash and then it's spinning. It's shit. It's awful, and yet it's so iconic. It's so. It's camp. That's what it is. It's camp. It's the f- because it starts off as oh sexy oh I'm oh I'm chasing you oh I'm chasing you and then suddenly the harshest cut into like it's like the end of Casino Royale the music and it's like yeah. she's gonna die and it's like they've been in love for a full two and a half hour film and now she's in the elevator drowning yeah like that's the climax to the film like, but it's not Hans Zimmer right I want to know what chicken or the egg. Gladiator or this. I mean, a Gladiator comes out after, but Hans Zimmer literally uses the same... Like the soft music that he does It's not Gladiator. his best film. It's not his best film he's, he's ever... Dun, 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 dun. I do like... I do like the that, but... Yeah, it's just a weird scene. I just don't really get it. I don't... I feel like they were like, right, how are we going to get them to fall in love? I know, Ethan kills her, mm. nearly kills her, but then he saves her. And then she's straddling him while they're in a car that's about to tip off an edge and they start nearly kissing. And it's like, what is actually going on here? Because, not being funny, but if someone did that to me, I'd be screaming and shouting at them. They did it in uh, with, with our, one of our other favourites, Vanessa Kirby, in uh, Hobbs and Shaw. There's a scene I haven't like seen that. it, thankfully. I watched Hobbs and Shaw also on that week of breaking up uh, on, on a, in, a, in a cinema. It was a, it was a lovely, that, that one pepped me up. I like anytime that Idris Elba goes genocide, schmenocide uh, is, is, is a good movie. And Vanessa Rocky Kirby Pets. is just good in general. Yes. Uh... I have to say, <laughs> Thandie Thand- Newton is, is one of my favourites. Really? I think she's beautiful in this film. I always wanted to look just like her. Sandy Newton, very, very beautiful woman. Yes. Are you a Westworld fan? Uh, I was of the first series. Oh. oh, she was on Line of Duty as well, apparently. Never watched it. I've never done Line of Duty either. Um, yes, no, uh, appeared... Oh, she was Condoleezza Rice in W. I, I need to watch W for a... I know uh... she was actually... She was in an interview with a vampire. Well, yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> is, is Interview with a Vampire a movie that you like as much as I do? I, I've only seen it once and it was like years ago. Louis! Louis! <laughs> I remember that Tom Cruise is great in that film. Tom Cruise is great as Lestat. Lestat. Um, Brad Pitt. I never thought I'd see Sun. Um, I love Interview with a Vampire. Like, unironically, think it's yeah, great. Yeah, it's a good film. Kirsten Dunst is excellent in it. I don't like her though. Oh. Oh, I mean, this is a I always feel like conversation. She... Yeah, I always feel, yeah. It's not about Mission Impossible, so. We can do, right, I've got, you've got, a, we've got a minute and a half on Kirsten Dunst. Go. She just always sounds like she's about to cry. And I never mm. liked her as MJ. I never. I just, I think she's got a weird face. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, she looks, she, I mean, you know, she's, she's good looking or whatever, but oh, yeah. just some, something about her aura is off to me. I just don't like it. Are you her a Fargo person? Wrong. No. She's very good in Fargo season two. Are you a the beguiled person? No. 
I mean, the Beguiled is a movie. You you and your friend flirted. Um, I don't know whether it might still be happening or whatever, but you flirted uh, with the idea of a. Oh. oh. No, it's, I don't no. think it's happening. But there was a movies directed by women podcast, and I immediately said, "I have to be on the Beguiled episode." Yeah. <laughs> love the Beguiled. Kidman, Elle Fanning, Kirsten Dunst, Colin Farrell, four of my favorite women. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, the beguiled is like legit. Just ex- love the beguiled, love, love, love the beguiled. And I think it also has the nice guys girl in young, like younger before she's in the nice guys. I like nice guys. Nice Still. guys is great. Nice guys is great. Uh, enough about Dunst talk. You can tune in to Dun- the Dunst cast, <laughs> um, um, which takes us into. Uh, oh yeah, I've got a couple of terrible single minutes. The Gleason deathbed sequence where he's going for an Oscar that he'll that what the hell? I, John McCloy, profit from death. Yeah, like chill out, man. Calm down, Brendan. Um, <laughs> I do kind of I I mean I do kind of like the fake out that you think that Sean Ambrose is the one in the mask. Hmm. And you think that you know T Cruz, Ethan is the one trying like talking to yeah. her there is lots of masks in this movie so many bloody masks I think chill it's out a step too far chill out with all the masks i think, get it i think we need to expect the biggest mask ever in like two movies because now they feel embarrassed of the masks and they only do it in like comedy reveals yeah, like Benji really wanting to wear a mask and getting yeah. excited he gets to wear a mask. And like Although the start I of just... Fallout, the start of Fallout's excellent, but it's like, yeah, do you remember the masks? Ha, 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 we're going to do no, that in no, the first no. scene. But actually, I there is a really excellent use of masks in Fallout, and that's the, the bit with Henry Cavill, and he's like talking to him. Mm. He's like, no, and it's Benji in the mask. That is pretty good. But... Yeah that's when they've got used to using the masks and they use it more sparingly and only when it's needed. This film, why is there so many people wearing masks? And they've just given up on the whole, I'm going to dress like Tom Cruise. (laughs) Uh, Tom Cruise in a wig is the senator and he just so happens to look like Tom Cruise in a wig. Yeah. Uh, They've just given up with that. And I I mean, the voice strips are a stroke of genius. Uh, Yeah, that that is genuinely clever. It's like, the most stupid shit in the world, but thank at least it's there. At least the thought was there. Yeah, and I think as the films go on, they do explain more like how the masks like how the fuck did Ethan make the mask for the blonde South African? How did where did he make that? Seeing as later on in the series we find out that they have like a box yeah. that like paints it. Or they have then later on it gets even more advanced. How because did he that do is that? Far too much not part of the plan. Or or was that just the plan the whole time? Yeah, I don't know. I have to say, I actually do really like the bit where it's what's his name in the masks of Ethan and he's not saying anything. Yeah, that's cool. And then he shoots him. Yeah, but he shoots him and goes. This is how you, this is what's called getting off a gun. It's like, what, sorry, sorry, was that English? And yeah, and then you got Ethan running out and ripping yeah. off the mask, and then it dun 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 dun. dun, dun. dun, dun. <laughs> that bit's they, pretty good. They are held by one of the greatest pieces of music like ever written in pop culture. So anytime it drops, you're, you're on board. Um, Tom's weirdly specific favorite part of the film. I've got the first mash reveal on the airport, on the airport. Yeah. I think it's a really cool. Um, I've got, I've put here rock cum faces because every single time Tom Cruise makes a rock like grab, he goes, ah. Oh, it's, I didn't notice that. Well, I did. Um, surprise face at glasses. Oh, does it twice when the helicopter arrives and goes, <laughs> it's like surprise. And then the shoot down the missile and then he pulls the glasses out. He's like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Uh, the car spin. Uh, Dove. Uh, Dove masks Luther Tash. What? That must be three, but I've not done <laughs> made them separately. Yeah. And then the, uh, then the motorcycles. 
Oh my god, the, my favourite bit. Here's my favourite bit of the most them ridiculousness. Catching, them catching each other. Um, yeah, what, why is it so... Like, I don't know. It's kind of erotic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of sexual. Also, I thought that the, the blonde guy was in love with Sean Ambrose. Yes, it was, was very North some, by Northwest. It was definitely I was getting some now. homoerotic... Yeah. Some homo, homoerotic um, longing there. I always think they should do the... It's Arrested Development and it's like the bad seasons later on, but like there's a whole thing about wearing masks and like people having sex with each other. And I'm like, you know, at one time they should do that. There should be yeah. just like a thing where they're like, yeah, I've always wanted to fuck myself. So like, what? Make a mess. If you, if you watch The Boys, have you seen The Boys? On I haven't the... watched The Boys. Oh, there's kind of a scene a bit like that. Is there a shapeshifter and they get to have sex with themselves? Maybe. Mm. I'll watch it now. No. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, any uh, your sp- weirdly specific, your more general favorite parts, or is it? Or does nothing top the motorcycle catch? Um, the bit where oh, you know what's a I, I bit I like is when Sean Ambrose is well. It's not Sean. Am- I just don't. I just I just didn't like him that much as an actor, actually. <laughs> where he's like, um, "You should have killed me." The- <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> yeah, that is bad. And then, like Ethan kicks up the gun, yeah. And instead of just like catching it and swinging around, he catches it and like swings around and then falls to the ground and shoots him. And then Sandy Newton is like, she's like crawled off the 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 seat and is like crouched on the ground. It's like, why are you doing that, love? Like that somewhere. entire the final half an hour of the movie, Sandy Newton is just stood there. Every like every five minutes, it'll cut to her stood on that cliff and. Why did she go all the way out there? Because she could, because she could have injected oh, people with Chimera them. before they had the Balerathon. Um, I I love that at the end, it's like they're like, yeah, we're together now, and then you never see her or talk about her ever again. Um. Which takes us into, I don't think there's an Oscar travesty here. <laughs> um, excuse me. <laughs> uh, best line. You should have killed me. <laughs> you should have killed me. Is very fun. I am a bit, but whether it's good or bad, I'm a big fan of go to bed and lie. She's a woman. That's all the qualifications she'll need. Um, which takes us into best line. Um, I mean... Mr. Hunt, this isn't Mission Difficult. It's Mission Impossible. Difficult should be a walk in the park for you. Yeah. How do we feel about that? I mean, yeah. It's kind of true. Mm. Um, Kind of true. Legitimately great line, and I'm amazed that Tom Cruise let it in. You know, that was the hardest part about having to betray you, grinning like an idiot every 15 minutes. Like, that's pretty good. Yeah, this is the thing. Tom Cruise isn't perfect. And again, we want to state we do not necessarily agree with Tom Cruise's political or religious beliefs. Just his beliefs on COVID on set. However, I do think that he's quite, not self-deprecating, but he can make fun of himself. Because he will have had to agree to that line being in there. Yeah. It's not like the Vin Diesel thing of like when they have to like count the punches that people take, like on the fa- like all these insane stories from the Fast and Furious movies. Yeah. Of like everybody like like when the Rock and Vin Diesel used to fight and it'd be like, okay, they're allowed one punch, they're allowed this punch, and uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do? Spank me. Mm. Mm. The bit where she's like, what did she say? Where it's like, I want to go on top. And yeah. then he's like, works for me or something works like that. Works for like. me. <laughs> and then you get a gratuitous shot down her top. It's like four shots and it's just down her cleavage. Brian De Palma. The fact that Brian De Palma, one of the most sleazy and gloriously, wonderfully sensuous filmmakers of all time, didn't have a gratuitous shot in his movie. <laughs> and John Woo did. Well, there we go. 
We but just rolled like, up a snowball and tossed it into hell. Now let's see what chance it has. Terrible. Like, in the later films, like with Ilsa, she's sexy, mm. but she's not really sexualized necessarily. Like, you do have the shot of her and her leg, but it's like, that's cool. It's like sexy and like a... She's using that leg. It's not just, oh, look, my boobs are out. Yeah. It's it's... It, it's that whole thing of like the the basic instinct stuff of he's sorry she's um she's what do you call it she's it's all her yeah it's all her decision yeah um which takes us on to uh oh no i still have a best i still have another best line um well she wasn't exactly gagging for it when you left six months ago i did I think they could have taken it further. I mean, I, I mean, clearly, Do Grey Scott is not talented enough to convey it, as we see with the crying scene. But um, I think they could have really played up the the love triangle a bit more, made him like yeah. an angry cook or something. And I he think, came across so creepy. I know, and give Tandy something to do, like you know, give Tandy a fuck you line of darling. You know, did right here's something. the logistics is that technically rape because she clearly did not want to have sex with him but she did she agreed to have sex with him but she didn't really want to well that's yeah that's rape yeah he's a creep i don't like this sean amber i don't and you know what i just didn't like the actor that much either. let the record show when i said that sean ambrose is a really fun villain i wasn't talking about the scene where he rapes a woman <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the bill. I was like, oh yeah, it's really cool. And he's like, when he's really funny, and then when he like coerces her into sex. Um, yeah. No, but like, I just, I don't know. I didn't find, I didn't like him as an actor, and um, I'm glad that Ethan shot him dead. You should have. Ki- I'm glad he did kill you. I'm glad he did. And you know what? I'm gonna say it. I'm glad he wasn't Wolverine. Oh no, so am I. He so- could not have pulled it off. Yeah. He didn't have the looks for it. Hugh Jackman. Huge jacked man, Hugh Jackman. And like, I don't think Do Gray Scott could have done an American accent. Maybe he wasn't American. Also, well, Wolverine is American. Does he have to be? Yeah. Okay, comic nerd. <laughs> yeah, he does actually. But like, he like you think Do Gray Scott could have done Logan? No, he couldn't. No. No, okay. He doesn't have the acting chops. I would have loved to. I I wonder if, you know, in the alternate reality where he could have been Wolverine, where he didn't have the blooming motorcycle accident or whatever, and Mm -hmm. there's no delays on Mission Impossible 2. Would we have seen Do Grey Scott in Australia and in blooming Grey Showman? No, because Do Grey Scott's not Australian, and that was the whole big thing about that, was that um, it was like Nicole Kidman and and Hugh Jackman are both Australian in real life. So they're making Australia, <laughs> with, Australia. with Bez Lerman. Um, I remember that film because that's how I learned about Aborigines in Australia. Hmm. And a lot of people still don't, to this day, don't know that, you know, there are native people to Australia. Yes. That was the whole plot of that movie, wasn't it? Was that the guy yeah. the guy had killed one of them, wasn't it? Mm. And, th- and like then that. he had, and then he had these boots. I remember, like, I remember that as a kid. I remember there's a bit with with cows <laughs> and someone drowning in a at the water thing. I'm gonna right. I feel like Australia is gonna be like three hours long. Yeah, it's two hours and forty five minutes. How how right. is Australia? And it has 55% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's... Um... Now, the question is, if me and you watch Australia, we're such suckers for Nicole Kidman, Hugh Jackman, and, like, big, long, sweeping romances. Are we going to, like... We're going to love it. Secretly, <laughs> secretly, like, become, like, the biggest Australia stands in the world. <laughs> like, no, guys, Australia's great. Watch it again. I might have to do a Baz Luhrmann article, but I don't like Strictly Ballroom, and I don't really like his Great Gatsby. And I love he... Romeo and Juliet, though. Yeah, yeah, Romeo, and as we talked about, Moulin Rouge. 
Um, has Baz Luhrmann done anything since Australia? I don't know. I don't keep tabs on him. Oh, yeah. So, of course, he did The Greatest Showman. No, 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 no. Untrue. Great Gatsby, that's what I mean. Yeah. Then he did an episode of The Get Down. Which apparently is quite good. And then he's done a couple, and then he's been doing ads. Um, Adverts? Okay. Oh, my God. There's a Nicole Kidman Chanel advert, and she looks like that. Well, that needs to be viewed. Yeah, but I don't... that makes you sound so creepy, Tom. Says the woman who's like, oh, Tendy Newton. I love Tendy Newton, but I also want to look like her. <laughs> well, that's the joys of being attracted to women and wanting to look like sexy women. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I'm not. No, I love Nicole Kidman. I wasn't saying it needs to be viewed later. Oh, for, when she oh. looks Chanel advert. Oh, when she looks like that. That's going to be watched later. I legitimately, I understand now how that sounds like I want to masturbate. <laughs> It genuinely meant I'll watch it after this podcast recording. I understand how it sounded. Um, but Nicole Gimmon is a stunningly, stunningly beautiful woman. I like how we dislike this film so much that half the time we're not talking about this film. There was an episode uh, we did on August Osage County, um, which is a fine film. But that's it. This, this film is good in that it's that bad. It's good. Mm. But it does have long stretches of boredom. Oh, my God, yeah. That for me, also, like, we couldn't do a big party and watch this. No. There's too many There's too many long scenes. Like, people talk about so bad it's good movies. I love The Wicker Man because it's so tight. I love 88 Minutes is my one of my favourite Pacino movies. I still want to do it on the show. I don't know who I can get on to talk about it. But he's a detective called Guy Lafarge. <laughs> Oh um, I love love 88 Minutes uh, great movie, not really, terrible <laughs> absolutely terrible um, but um, you know what I'm trying to say uh, where are we, what's the change I mean there's lots of changes, we've talked about them a lot, a different director or no, okay, yeah yeah, or more action if you're going to yeah. make it let action. him actually do what he's good at John Woo isn't good romance. at contemplative say, romance and, and, and you know, like, mission talk. I say get rid of the romance and instead, mm. and I said this last time, you know, with Jim and his wife, change that, that it's his daughter. Why not have, seen as he mentors someone in the third film, why not have this be someone he's mentored that got mixed up undercover with Sean Ambrose mm. or was his girlfriend in the IMF? Then she's back and she's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to help you. I fuck the IMF. Like, let's get loads of money and have his, someone he's mentoring go undercover. I don't think Mission Impossible necessarily needs this kind of romance. No. As we Woo's know. not good at it. It's just, it's good at. Give the woman some bloody agency. Well, the we know that be... as well, yeah. The only time she has agency is when she decides to... to kill herself. <laughs> kill herself, basically. That's the only time she's got any kind of agency, which is really sad because when she's first introduced, she's really cocky and, like, sure she's of like, herself. She's like Catwoman. She's like this sexy cat thief, and she's, ooh, ooh. And it's like Anne Hathaway in, like, the Bat- Dan Knight Rises first scene, and it's like other examples of thieves. <laughs> Yeah, but she's like cocky and she's sure yeah, of herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then she's reduced to this like snivelling, whining, like. And also, there's just there's no stakes at all because we don't really care about the relationship because of the way she's been written. We're not like huge fans of Naya. We just really like Tandy Newton, um, and so like Tom Cruise is like, it's okay because if we don't get there in time, she'll kill herself anyway. And it's like okay, so there's no threat. Yeah. But we're just like, okay, we don't want Teddy Lewis to kill herself, but, you know, at the end of the day, if everybody dies of a disease. Um, it, yeah, I just, I think that the lack of agency for her character is is, is such a shame because yeah. of the way she's introduced. She could have been a really, really interesting character. And I think that is something, you know, the first film kind of struggled with. Claire was quite whiny and didn't really do much. And she kind of just did what she was told. And then, and then bang. <laughs> 
And then you think, oh, wow, Naya's different. She's like, I thought she was going to argue back with him more and like. Yeah. Stuff like well, that. But... I think, I think, and I don't think the chemistry is entirely there, but I do think that recruiting scene and the, and the thieving and he's doing the alarm, that's just like pure Thomas Crown affair and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It's those, yeah, you it's know, kind of, it's fun. It's, it's fun, fun and I was... sexy, these thieves, these criminals or whatever. Obviously, he's not a criminal, but that back and forth. And I think it works a little bit. Not a, not a lot, but it, it works a little bit. I just think that Wu, he's not, he's not good at the romance. No. And whoever Especially... the scriptwriter was isn't good at romance. No. He is good at romance, just not here. Yeah. And it sounds great. Uh, but especially like, but even that like banter, sexy banter, she like slaps him in the penis and he just goes, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Terrible. Um, which takes us into anything left from your notes, Katrina? You like, don't take why notes. Do... You don't take notes. I remember every time. Yeah, but like why? Like this, oh. this is another thing. We get no example of why she was ever involved with Sean Ambrose in the first place, because yeah, they don't have any chemistry. They don't have any fun, really. He's like a just weirdo. Yeah, like they don't. There's nothing that I. Th- I just feel like there should have been more. Not as in a longer time, but take bits out that were unnecessary. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, which takes us into. A few fun facts. Um, Tom's then wife, Nicole Kidman, suggested Tandy Newton because uh, uh, they made the movie Flirting together in 1991. Hmm. Um, yeah, as the love interest for Ethan Hunt, she was cast before the script was even written. Hmm. So they'd clearly gone into this going, he needs a love interest this time. Yeah. That was like a big thing for them. Anyway. I wonder, I know that. Tandy Newton didn't come back because she decided to focus on her family. That's I wonder nice. if I wonder if in the third film, instead of Julia, it would have been Naya then. It makes sense. And then we would have had her for a longer... Yeah, I, I, and maybe in the aftermath, which she would have had a more fleshed out character. Mm. Yeah, but then, then, then she can't just be the wife, can she? Then... Yeah, no, I mean, I imagine the story would have been different, but yeah, I wonder yeah, yeah. if in the early conception, Julia was supposed to be Naya. Yeah. Uh, production was heavily delayed, as we've discussed, because crews were shooting Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, it was slated to begin filming in mid-1997, but in the end, it would be filmed in 99, as crews spent the entirety of 97 and a chunk of 98 working on Eyes Wide Shut, which was oh, originally God. intended to be filmed over six months in 1996. Kubrick, what a man. Um, and I know, I know there was more delays because there's like loads of down, like um, downpours, like loads of yeah. rain in Australia, and then it delayed it by like two, three months or something. Yeah, like they 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 were against it. They were against it. Um, Tom Cruise and John Woo clashed over some of the stunts as Woo wanted stunt doubles. Oh no, no, that's a no, no. Uh, and Cruz was adamant about doing them. He told Wu he didn't like cheating, that it's too easy to spot when the actor is being doubled. I agree. I agree. It, it didn't help that Wu is afraid of heights. That's... Yeah, because he couldn't watch uh, Tom Cruise do the rock stunts in the beginning. He couldn't watch it. Um, are you ready for a sliding doors moment? Oh, Yes. Captain Commander Swanbeck was originally offered to Sir Ian McKellen. Yes, he was. And McKellen's agent was stunned when he turned down a small supporting role. Had he accepted it, however, he wouldn't have been Gandalf and he wouldn't have been Magneto. That is crazy. It's like the opposite of Dougray Scott. That's that like... Yeah. That would have been a big loss. Mm. Um, because of the hu- his huge back-end deals, Tom Cruise was forced to pay for the production overruns out of his own pocket. Obviously, he got all of that back. And, yes. and some. Uh, John Woo found himself locked out of the editing room by Cruise, who took ownership, ownership, oh, or ownership of the final cuts. Robert Town uh, based said that much of his script was written around action scenes that Wu told him he wanted to be able to direct. 
which is kind of how they do it with Marvel movies now. They're like, mm. they're already making the CGI battles mm. uh, as we speak, which is so dull and sad and leads to the movies. That this is not a Marvel hating thing. Mm. This is when I'm around. Each director in the franchises, as you've already said, has been asked to return for the sequel to their movies, all except for John Woo. Um, I'm surprised that like J.J. Abrams didn't do another. Or like, mm. I, I, I mean, obviously he's... Oh no, I'm not surprised, because then he gets snapped up for Star Trek, doesn't he? Yeah. And obviously he's going to choose that. Tom Cruise offered De Palma the chance to direct this movie, but De Palma declined. Um, would have been would have been interesting. Uh, would have been better. Uh, I think. Yeah, undoubtedly. I I but haven't we said before? Like I don't think De Palma's done any sequels ever. So true. John Woo was concerned about competing with Brian De Palma's style, but Tom Cruise was very adamant that he wanted Woo style, as he loved Woo style. That's fun to say. Um, Cruz's goal was to have each movie, each episode, be a different style from a different director. This made Wu feel relaxed. And obviously that's the way they went for a long time until Macquarie doubled down. And then he was like, oh, actually, yeah, no. Yeah, okay. Rogue Nation and Fallout were like, the, in my opinion, like the best. Oh, yeah. Um, Macquarie was originally supposed to do Top Gun 2. Oh, which was exciting, yeah. but then it, it's like got passed on. Has he done? Is he done number seven? Has he directed number seven? <laughs> yeah, Macquarie's on number seven, I believe. Let me double double check, but I believe so. Mission Impossible Seven is directed by Christopher Macquarie and written by Christopher Chris, Christopher Macquarie. Christopher. Um, Vanessa Kirby's back. Pom Clementif is back. Who you know as uh, Mantis from Guardians Mantis. of the Galaxy? Yeah. Yeah. Carrie Elwes is going to be there. I love him. Um, Mark love Gatiss Princess Bride. Be, Mark A- Gatiss is going to be there. Interesting. Uh, Rob Delaney is going to be there, one of my favourites. Great. A huge catastrophe fan. Oh, my God. I didn't know this. Henry Zinni is coming back, who you may know better as Eugene Kittredge. No way, Kittredge is back. Oh, how exciting. How exciting. Is, is um, you know, the, the gang is like Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson's on. Hayley Atwell's on as well, actually. Oh, she's got the same birthday as me. Uh, Cruz is on. Ving Rhames is back. And Simon Pegg is back. Yeah. Okay, good. I feel oh, like. And Indiri, uh, Indiri Varma, who you'll know as uh, Luther's wife from the first season. And oh, then, no way. Yeah, I like her a lot, actually. She's going to be in it as well. Um. Oh, you know what? Mm. Ever since the fourth film, they went back to the original TV show was kind of like, oh, we've got a gang now. Yeah. I it's don't like-, like Jeremy Renner that much, but I do wish they brought him back for the sixth one. Yeah, it's like... Um. Well, I think it was so very clear... Like, Born Leg- in the space of, like, two years of Born Legacy and Mission Impossible 4, it was very clear that Jeremy, Jeremy Renner was put into two movies as the next, like, to carry these things on for another four movies, and mm-hmm. neither worked. And I don't well, I know think, where Cruz think... was in the conversations around Ghost Protocol, because I just don't see him handing it over. I think that um, after Rogue Nation, I think Jeremy Renner was going to come back, but then his Marvel contracts got... I mean, he he must have been filming like the Avengers Endgame for a while. Yeah. Uh, For the knife in the eye scene, Tom Cruise insisted that a real knife be used and that it stop exactly one quarter inch from his eyeball instead of somewhere vaguely near his eye, as John director, as director John Woo suggested. The knife was connected to a cable that was measured carefully in order to achieve the effect and Cruz insisted that Do Gray Scott use all of his strength in the ensuing struggle. That is so crazy. I'm alive. Uh, why? Because he's mental. And this instalment features the highest amount of mask wearing. I think that's obvious to anybody. And it has the worst tagline I've ever seen. Expect the impossible again. Oh, great. Get a fucking grip. Um, Tom's big question. 
the exploding glasses, you are five seconds. What about like the person that <laughs> like slips or doesn't hear or? What if it, what I always get, so you know, like when I'm wearing a mask and I come out of a shop and I've got a mask on and I wear my glasses, I always get my mask caught on my glasses or I get my glasses caught in my hair. What if I, what if he's got long flowing locks? What if the glasses got caught in his hair and he couldn't get it out? He's dead. Great. Five seconds. Five seconds. And they're it's, on his face. Yeah, it's not as good as in, I want to say Rogue Nation when he's, he's watching a book and it's like a projector and then he closes it and then it goes... Pfft. Yeah, the smoke. There's the record play. There's the record shop in Fallout. No, that's Rogue Nation. That's Rogue Nation. I think. I think the other one might be Fallout. Then the one I'm talking about, Rogue Nation and Fallout feel they don't feel like the same film, but they are very much the most. Oh, this is a continuation. Well, it's the, the first story. movie. It's the first time we've ever had the same director twice. Yeah. I think um, it works as well. It does work. It definitely works. Definitely works. The um, first three films feel so different to oh, yeah. four, five, and six. Um, well, we're going to conclude this little trilogy of very, very different movies next week uh, with Mission Impossible 3, with J.J. Abrams. Um, that's I'm, ex- I mean, I'm excited to gonna... talk about it. I haven't watched it in a while, yeah. so... I haven't, yeah, no, I haven't watched that in a while either. Um which I kind of, when I'm, when I'm doing, when the next one comes out, I usually watch the one previously. Um, and then... Or... I think for this one, I'd watch Rogue, Rogue Nation and... Well we, will, and then... well, we will be, won't we? Well, no, it'll yeah. probably come out next year. I don't know. Anyway, um, Katrina, it's been a distinct pleasure. We've got, yes. we've got four more. We've got four more. Mission Impossible 3. Philip Zimmer Hoffman, rest in peace. Here we go, buddy. Da ba da ba da ba da ba 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 